welcome back to Mechanical Pros uh, here with Quentin, and we are going to dig into compressor forensics, slicing open compressors, looking at what failed inside of it, and uh, using that information to determine what the problem was so we could avoid it in the future. Quentin, tell me what we got going on here. Sure. So anytime that you have a compressor failure, that's generally just a symptom. Okay. So compressors don't just die, they're murdered, right? What we have here is a VRV3 inverter driven compressor. Okay. We've already cut it apart. Uh, that's why it's in two pieces. These compressors don't come in two pieces. This will actually sit on top of this, okay? So inside of this compressor is a motor and some scroll plates, mm -hmm. okay? The motor drives the scroll plates. That's how we get a pressure change for compression. So the first thing that you would want to do is cut the top off of the compressor. We have a compressor cutting tool here, and now we have already exposed um, the fixed scroll plate as well as a top plate that you'll see. Um, you also see that there's this little round piece. This is the check valve for the suction pipe. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as that compressor turns on, you get a pressure change. That check valve is going to drop down and allow the suction gas to flow into the scroll section. So we'll pop this plate off the top. Generally, this is bolted down. But what happens is the suction gas is passed through um, the scroll section. The pressure is elevated and then they are ejected through the top of the scroll and then pushed down to here. So it's going through there, getting mm -hmm. compressed, so low pressure to immediate high pressure, Yep. and then discharged out. That's right, yep. and this motor is actually a uh, discharge gas cooled motor, so that's a little bit different than a traditional um, scroll compressor. Um, so basically the, the motor windings are cooled post compression. Okay, okay, so the suction gas isn't flowing across. Our motor windings, it's actually the discharge gas. So it's getting compressed and then and then passing over, right. the, over the windings. Exactly. Gotcha. So you've got refrigerant and oil um, passing over your motor windings, which brings us to the next point is the sump. Okay, so all of the oil we want, in a perfect world, we want all the oil to stay in the compressor. But real world is it doesn't happen because the oil gets entrained in the refrigerant, the refrigerant carries it throughout the system. Yeah, okay. that's one thing that I feel like a lot of people don't commonly know is mm -hmm. that oil and refrigerant are, are gonna be in the same fluid and it's gonna to travel together. You gotta to have enough refrigerant, enough oil for everything to work right. Exactly, absolutely, absolutely. And the main thing is we wanna make sure that this oil is making its way back to the compressor. You know, we know that it's gonna go out there, but we need to bring it back in. If it doesn't okay? come back, it's gonna burn up. That's exactly right. Yep because the lifeblood of this compressor is the oil, okay? The oil has to be present in order for the compressor to survive. In addition to that, this is what we call the fixed scroll plate. Uh, generally, it'll be bolted down to the casing of the compressor. So if we remove that, we'll expose the bottom of the scroll. And then this is what we call the movable scroll, okay? So as this motor turns, it's going to turn this scroll. And so what happens is these two scroll plates mesh together and then we get compression, okay? The oil from the base is gonna travel up the shaft of our rotor because this is the rotor of the motor essentially. This is also uh, commonly referred to as the rotating assembly. The oil will travel up through the center of the shaft and you notice a few holes here on each sides of these. Mm -hmm. That's where bearings will reside, okay? So in order for this area to stay lubricated, it has to push the oil through. So if any one of these holes get restricted, there's one on the top as well, then you're not gonna be lubricating the bearings properly. Or if you don't have enough oil, you won't be uh, lubricating the bearings properly. And so this is essentially, um, just like a journal bearing style um, bearing. And so it's pretty much just metal to metal, okay? So that's why the oil is extremely critical. So the oil will travel up through the center of the shaft. It'll come through the top and then pass through um, a little orifice here in the, uh, in the base of the movable scroll. Okay. And then it will be um, ejected through this little tiny hole right here at the top. And that's, you see how small that is. If I were to take an ink pen and stick it in there, it's, it's smaller than, right. than that. You know, so it's very easy for this hole to become restricted. And so that's why we wanna make sure that the system is very, very clean upon installation. And whenever we're doing repair work, we wanna make sure to keep everything as clean as possible because it doesn't take much to restrict this. There's also a, a screw that resides in the side of here. We've got this in another scroll plate. This is a damaged scroll plate. You notice how it's flat. This is actually a yeah, compressor. Yeah, that's, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, this, <laughs> this is a scroll plate that is uh, experienced some liquid compression. And so all the bits and pieces um, actually broke off the scroll plate. So just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of what the difference between the two is, you see yeah. that they're vastly different. Okay, so these are two different model compressors, but same uh, general idea. Okay, so the oil will travel along this screw. 
and pass over here. So once again, if one of these little uh, crevices gets restricted, again, you lose oil flow to the scroll plate. So with that being said, contaminants in the system, um, you know, getting stuck in between these bearings, I mentioned before that this is all just essentially uh, metal on metal pieces, right? So that just goes on there like that. And if there's no oil in there, if there's oil with uh, contaminants, sand, dirt, carbon, uh, metal flakes of any, any kind, then that's obviously gonna cause um, significant wear. And if you look on this one, you can actually see some scoring and some heat marks where it's been really hot. Yeah. And then you'll notice the same thing on the bottom. You kind of see a little bit of copper plating, oh, yeah. some scoring. Mm -hmm. And then it's the same deal. Okay, there's a, a bearing uh, metal down here and this just rides like this. It just sits in there and then it just free spins. Okay, so the motor um, essentially drives the scroll and any of your um, metals that are magnetic will get caught in the basin. Most of them will get caught in the basin because so there's we, some magnets in the we bottom. We do have a magnet in the bottom. There's three magnets in the bottom, um, but it's not gonna catch you know things like copper, aluminum, non-ferrous metals, it's not gonna catch those. Um, it'll catch steel, iron, those type of things, but um, you know, it, it, once those magnets are, are loaded up with metal, if you have a rear differential cover, same idea, mm -hmm. right? Once it gets loaded up with metal, once it's saturated with metal, it can't take on any right. more metal. And then that stuff's just scattered through the system. So you blanket those magnets, it's not gonna pick up any more shrapnel. Exactly. It's gonna go straight to, through the oil system and clog it up, and then you're gonna have an oil, uh, an oil failure, yeah. like a compressor failure. Exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. Quentin, tell me about bearings. I always hear about bearings going bad in the compressor. Sure. So you have a bottom bearing and a top bearing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the bottom one is gonna reside right here. As you can see, right, right here in the sump, so to speak. Um, what will happen is um, if this bearing gets hot and distorted, it will actually, uh, a lot of times in the automotive industry, you might hear some people say it spun a bearing. Okay, mm -hmm. this is the same kind of idea. If this spins inside this race, it's gonna drop down. Okay, this is a press fit bearing. It's supposed to stay right here. If it falls out, it's totally useless. And then this thing is gonna get to vibrating like an old bulldozer or something. Okay. You know, it's gonna shake very violently. Um, and a lot of times that causes things like broken capillary tubes, broken discharge pipes, broken suction pipes. Um, really catastrophic failure if that occurs. So if you're vibrating, something's out of balance, something's not right, exactly. you need to shut it down, get it examined, repair it. Exactly, if you have a compressor that's vibrating, you know, and it's violent and you can audibly hear it, it's already too late. Yeah. That compressor's already done. It'd be in your best interest to go ahead, lock that compressor out, get it replaced immediately and do a root cause analysis. What caused the compressor failure? Again, compressors don't die for no reason. Mm -hmm. You need to be using service checker data to identify liquid refrigerant returning to the compressor, um, inspecting your oil return circuitry, looking for temperature drops and things such as that. It's good practice, especially if you've never messed with this particular system before. If you're doing a compressor replacement here at MRG, we always just go ahead and change the oil strainer while we're at it. That way you can cut the oil strainer open. It's a, it's a fairly cheap part. You can inspect it, see if it's restricted. And you know, that helps with your root cause analysis. Compressors aren't made to be cut no. apart. Once you cut them up, I mean, you're never, all we're doing is cutting it apart to figure out why it, why it specifically yeah, failed. It's autopsy. Yeah. And so what is the, uh, what are, what are the number one things you're always looking for when you when you do a diagnostic sure. autopsy? Now, rarely um, you might see a, a complete uh, compressor scroll failure. This is not extremely common, but it does happen. Um, this is actually a fixed scroll from a Daikin uh, VRV3 system. So if this um, scroll section loads up with liquid, these compressors are not designed to compress liquid. Everybody yeah. always says that, but that's what that means. We're not actually designed to compress liquid, we're com designed to compress vapor. Mm -hmm. So if liquid gets in here, it's gonna bust the scroll plate, yeah. if it's a significant enough amount of liquid. The other thing that we always look at, restricted oil circuitry. So the best way to cut these open is with like a, um, a pipe cutting machine, a large pipe cutting machine or a hand cutter. If, if you've eaten your Wheaties, then you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're always looking for uh, plug to oil return uh, circuitry. So any of our oil or orifices, see how strong that magnet is. Yeah, it's pretty strong. Just looking for plugged oil holes and things like that. Looking for metal particulate in the basin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, basically anything that's not supposed to be there. You notice the scoring, a lot of times we might take um, a set of calipers and put it on uh, the shaft to actually show how much this metal has worn down. Because sometimes it's very significant, two, three millimeters, which is a country mile, you mm -hmm. know, whenever you're talking about really tight tolerances and press fit bearings. Yeah. This stuff is supposed to be very, very snug and it's just supposed to have um, 
oil in between it to lubricate it and seal it. Gotcha. Tell me about what you're looking for from a color uh, color differential, which might indicate you know high sure. high heat, high temp. Sure. So you're looking for hot spots, right? So uh, hot spots and copper plating. Okay. So like on this one, you can kind of see where it's discolored. It's not silver anymore. Okay. So just like um, I think of a good analogy, like a motorcycle pipe on a yeah. on a, a V twin Harley Davidson, right? Yeah. The, the pipes are always discolored right there at the header. Very similar here. Okay. So this is all should be all the same color because it should be all a consistent temperature. So if you're looking uh, here, you see copper plating and things like that. You can see where that bearing has began to, to fail. Another point worth mentioning is like the, a lot of, a lot of the compressor failures that we encounter are um, electrically failed. Okay. Okay. And so a lot of people automatically assume, well, if it's an electrical failure, it must be because there's acid in the system. Okay. So from the oil programs that we've implemented here, we found that acid is, an extre is not extremely common. Um, it does happen occasionally, but PVE oil, it doesn't create acid as well as easily as like mineral oil and POE oils did. It's always good to get a good oil analysis done. Anytime that you do a compressor uh, replacement, get an oil analysis done and see what type of cleanup needs to be done on that system. Um, but as far as electrical failures, generally electrical failures are caused by a mechanical failure. So like this compressor here, you would assume, okay, that was a mechanical failure, which it was but the fault code that actually shut the system down was an electrical failure, it was an E2, a short to ground, right? So what happened was this scroll obliterated and the particulate went floating through the compressor and damaged the windings on the compressor, nicked the coating, and it was able to short to ground that gotcha. way. So a lot of times if you have an electrical failure, you don't have to automatically assume that you need to change an inverter board or um, you know it's an electrically related issue, you've got dirty power or anything like that. Look into the mechanical side, um, nine and a half times out of 10, it's mechanically related. Yeah. Everything is depending on oil going through this orifice right here. Mm -hmm. Why is it so small? Why has it got to go through a screw, th a screw th that thread? Right, so it's designed in a very specific way, okay? So this, this system has been R&D'd to death. Uh, whenever they put this together, they found the precise amount of oil that needed to be added to this scroll plate in order to keep it properly and adequately lubricated, mm -hmm. okay? And so this screw here, it's kind of similar to like a capillary tube would be injecting oil into um, the suction line of a compressor. Mm -hmm. This is to basically, I don't want to say meter because we're not really changing states, um, but just to kind of uh, restrict the oil flow, so to speak. Just to right kind of keep the constant amount. Yeah, so this is like a fixed, think of this as like a fixed orifice. So you we can't have too have much amount. or too little. And right exactly. now, this is the best way that we can do it. Exactly. If this orifice is so small, uh, how, I feel like we always reinforce brazing or purging when we braze. Absolutely. And making sure we have a clean system before mm -hmm. we do startup. Absolutely. And talk about how that could be the, uh, the first point of failure. We always talk about purging and brazing. We talk about plugging strainers and, and you know, EEVs getting impacted and things like that. But oil return circuitry, the filters on the oil return circuitry is something that commonly gets, you know, not thought of. The capillary tubes, all of these orifices are very, very, very small. And so it's very easy for them to get restricted. You know, so once those are restricted and you have, um, let's say that, you know, you've just got one module. Let's say that you're fortunate enough to just have one module that has oil return issues, okay? Once those oil return issues are present, you have a damaged compressor. This stuff right here, the stuff that you can't see, the stuff that only is gonna get picked up on an oil sample analysis, mm -hmm. that's all floating through your system now. And it's very difficult and very expensive to get cleaned up. Yeah, and it's not gonna get picked up by the magnets. No, it's not gonna get picked up by the carbon. magnets. Yeah, a lot of it's carbon. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it is uh, the micron is so small that you know filter dryers won't even be able to pick it up mm -hmm. the strainers won't be able to pick it up i think the smallest strainer is something like 10 microns so some of this stuff is actually smaller than our finest metal mesh filter yeah. you know and so once it's in there you're gonna have a really really hard time getting it back out yeah well that's great to know if you haven't ever taken one apart you'll learn a ton just by doing it thanks for walking us through that quentin yeah hey hit that like hit the subscribe let us know if you guys want something else or uh or some more content and we'll try to bring it to you till then we'll see you next time on mechanical pros